Hey gang, Brian here. If you're coming to this episode from a podcast called Bring Me the Axe, I'd like to assure you that you're in the right place. Dave and I decided that before we got too deep into this podcast business, we changed the name of the show to something a little more original. As it happens, there's like six podcasts called The Brothers Grimm. It's hard enough already to stand out amongst all the other horror podcasts. Why make it harder on ourselves by confusing ourselves with other shows? From now on, we're the Bring Me the Axe Horror Pod. And if you want to connect with us on other platforms, you can find us simply by Googling Bring Me the Axe Horror Podcasts. We're everywhere. And now, on with the show. Brothers Grimm Podcast, presented by the Cinema Suicide Film Society on Substack. I'm Brian White, editor in grief of Cinema Suicide. I'm joined by my co-host and actual brother, Dave White. Dave, how you doing? It's pretty good. I was uh, taking, taking a sip there. <laughs> what do you got? What do you got tonight? Ah, this is, uh, this is a farmhouse ale with peaches. Hmm. Can you, can you taste yeah. the peaches? You actually can taste the peaches. It is conditioned on peaches, uh, all right. but it's not actually brewed with peaches. Oh, I don't know what conditioning is. What is conditioning? Uh, it just sits, it's, it soaks in peaches <laughs> or the peaches soak in the beer, I guess. Gotcha. Is, is the appropriate. Right. So we practically grew up in neighborhood video stores. The steady diet of garbage that those shops provided us with continues unabated to this day. There's no one else I enjoy chopping it up with more about trashy movies and Dave. And just before we get into it, here's a little housekeeping. If you want to keep up with us between episodes, you can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at Grim Bros Pod. You can also contact us directly at GrimBrosPod at gmail.com with any questions, comments, or suggestions. Do let us know if there's a movie that you would love and you'd like to hear us give it the business. Lastly, if you like what you hear, you can subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast. You'd be doing us a favor by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Just want to get all that out of the way at the top of the show. So... Before we get going, here's a warning. Uh, we're basically going to talk about this movie from beginning to end, so spoilers to follow. And so now here is the uh, here's the ceremonial taste. I'm going to give you a little taste of this here, this here movie we're watching tonight. A certain kind of girl joins Pi Theta sorority. A girl who likes to party and likes to get close to her friends. A girl whose extracurricular activities were more daring than most. A girl who could turn her fantasies into reality. One more sling won't set us back, any. Then again, Pi Theta was different from other sororities. I'll get back at you the last thing I do! Because in this sorority, nothing is off limits. As long as it's fun for the girls. <gasps> so when it came time to say goodbye, <laughs> they decided to make real sure that no one would ever forget the girls in the house on Sorority Row. That's right. House on Sorority Row. Yeah, let me tell you something. Uh, I would love to see that movie because that movie is not this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right right out of the gate. So that is the original theatrical trailer for this uh, for this movie, which like a lot of the movies we do on this show, it, I'd say sort of rep- misrepresents, but it really totally misrepresents with the the entire movie i suppose that really doesn't matter they're just trying to get people into the into theaters but what's really interesting to me is that the movie itself is very clearly trying to exploit popular slashers at the time but that trailer makes it look like the girls at the sorority are the murderers and it's it's a really strange way to sell this movie I'm not sure that the the people who made this movie actually know what it is that they wanted to do. It, this really feels like it's maybe two or three ideas kind of cobbled together. And I will say it, it's possible that I oversold this in my enthusiasm. <laughs> um, because I, every time I think about it, I think, God, I love this movie. And then I watch it and I think, yeah, I kind of like this movie. <laughs> um, but you know, having said that, this is way better than it has any right to be. I, You know, here's the thing is I... For whatever reason, there's like there's a whole bunch of like blind spots in the slasher movie canon for me. Just and it's mostly owing to the fact that like I'm just really fucking lazy and um you know, like why take a chance on something new when I can watch Friday the 13th part 2 again. You know, and so this is one of those movies that just kind of like 
lived in the blinds, like just like lived in the shadow for me. I really sort of like I passed it by about a thousand times on Shutter, and I had no intention of ever really picking it up. But for this episode, I watched it twice in relatively quick succession, and I enjoyed it both times. I think uh, the second time, since I was really paying attention to it and taking notes, like I really really liked it so you know yeah, it sneaks up on you yeah it, there's a lot to it and i'll tell you because you say they're trying to do a lot with the you know the sort of slasher tropes and they are like there's a lot of shit in this that's like very familiar but it so it falls sort of squarely in my favorite era which is like 75 to 85 yeah you picked that- most of these these movies that we've done so far and needless to say like we we've been addressing a very narrow band of, yeah. of like horror history between like 80 and 82. So, you know, it, it kind of, I, I, I eventually kind of came to realize like, oh, this is just like his favorite era. It is. And it's, I, I think it's because it's when it's like, they hadn't yet figured out what to do with the genre. Like yeah. it was clear that it was, it was different now. Like it had been remade by Halloween and by Black Christmas and all that, you know, the stuff in the late seventies, it had been kind of uh, reborn as something, but no one knew what that something was yet. Yeah. And so it's these kind of weird movies that sort of fumble around and they're kind of horror movies, but they're horror movies made by people who are influenced by things from a a previous era. So they're kind of weirdly tame, but also not tame. Like they're exploitive in a weird way, but not in their plot. Yeah. So I've got some, I've got some notes about that and and I suppose we'll, we'll get into this is the part where we do the, we do the facts about. So, well, actually I'll tell you one more thing about this because this is a thought I had while I was watching it is if you set this against uh, a movie that is from the same year that is relatively similar, uh, Slumber Party Massacre. Yeah. Now, Slumber Party Massacre, uh, written by a noted feminist lesbian, Rita Mae Brown, it is supposed to be a satire. Yeah. It is a critique of horror movie tropes. It doesn't really end up that way because it kind of got butchered in in between. Sure, like the 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 distributor had a different vision, yeah. But I would argue that this movie is maybe more unintentionally feminist than that is because this movie passes the Bechdel test time and time again. There are barely <laughs> any men in this movie. Yep. Yep. And, and the ones that are in it are inconsequential. Yeah. This and is, one of them's the killer. This is true. Yeah. So um, this movie was made, uh, this movie was made in 1981, but it was released late in 1982. Uh, so other movies released that year, Amityville Two: the possession, see our episode on Amityville Two. Uh, pieces also see our episode on pieces really see our episode on pieces nobody's listening to that one for some reason uh also jaws of satan uh which is a movie i had never heard of until i was just looking up other horror movies released and that it is not good it does not sound like a very good movie it's like it is well it is hilarious it is hilarious and fun but god it is bad yep uh also uh jean roland's living dead girl extra and of course poltergeist which is like one of my favorite movies of all time. Heard of it? Yep. yep. Little picture. So this was directed by a guy named Mark Roseman. And this is his first director directorial feature. He had done, uh, I looked this up. He was straight out of film school and he worked on, um, uh, he moved on a, on a, he was first AD for like a Brian De Palma picture right before this, which is quite a leap because usually, What's the movie? Uh, Sisters? God, no, I wish I, I'd taken it down a camera. Home movies, maybe? Ah. Uh, um, but uh, It's comedy. Yeah, yeah. He's a hilarious guy, that Brian De Palma. Especially when it comes to women. Actually, you know what? I'll give him this. Phantom of the Paradise is hilarious. I fucking love that. I love that goddamn movie. Uh, but yeah, this is, his first, this is his first feature. Following this movie, he'd fall in with the Disney Channel in the 80s, and he'd work fairly steadily for them as well as some TV and direct-to-video just forgettables. Uh, But he found his stride working on basically everything that the Disney Channel ever did with Hilary Duff, like, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago by this point. Who is Hilary Duff? Uh, One of the blonde Disney Channel girls. Uh, What the fuck was her show? Uh, Lizzie McGuire. It probably won't matter. It doesn't matter. But that was, he eventually kind of found found his niche uh, working working with, uh, with, uh, with that. Um, the reason, and this, the reason that he, and the entire reason that he made this movie was because he figured, uh, correctly that 
his like the fast track to becoming like a director professionally was to direct your own movie. So yeah, that's horror. That is why horror movies exist. Basically, because and, they're easy and cheap, and that's everyone's first. That's movie. the thing, and a part of me always bristles at that because like that's I, I love these movies like genuinely like. It, like in my heart, these like hold a very special place for me. But for the people who made them, it was a really just kind of like a, yeah, I'm just trying to get a job in the industry. And this is like, it costs nothing to make these movies. And, you know, especially if they turn a profit, which they all did, like even final exam turned uh, a pretty healthy profit. So like if you made a horror movie, George Romero did it, you know, Night of the Living Dead was supposed to be a fast track to, uh, Really, what he intended to make was movies like There's Always a Vanilla, which nobody's fucking seen that one, and everybody's seen Night of the Living Dead. Sam Raimi, the whole thing with with Evil Dead was he was like, the movies that I think that he always intended to make was like For the Love of the Game, which is the one that nobody fucking likes. Uh, but, Same with John Carpenter. John Carpenter didn't intend to be a horror film. Yeah, yeah. Like that's uh, it was like all of them just kind of leaping in. Like so, I think that I always just kind of like I have much more respect for guys like Joe Dante and like uh, Dario Argento who just wanted to make fucking horror movies, which is awesome to me. But you know these other guys who kind of like kind of tripped into the genre by accident, like they you know they they're all legends for a reason and they continue there is to something great. a little dismissive about it, it kind of undercuts everything it else. bumps me out and there's certain directors like john carpenter i i love him he's one of he's probably my favorite horror movie director but there is whenever he talks there's a weird sort of disappointment that comes through that like his he's a very bitter man he, yeah he doesn't and i don't know why his movies are fucking great like you know i get it that like the thing was supposed to be the big one and it bombed really hard and people were like super grossed out. And I think that time has been very kind to it. And uh, like nowadays there are legions of fucking fans. There are people, my favorite movie of all time is escape from New York. I fucking love that movie, but like to hear him talk about it, even today, he's still kind of bummed about the fact that it just underperformed at the box office. Yeah, There's that, that Guillermo del Toro story where he- Guillermo del Toro tells him something like, and this was like, I don't know, 2017. He tells him something like, you know, that movie was so influential for me. And it was really one of my favorite movies. It really blew me away. And he was like, yeah, well, it didn't do any good at the box office in 1982. And it's like, dude, that was 40 fucking years I ago. Know, get over it. You're you a goddamn icon. You could, you could just. Have, <laughs> what more do you want? He could have coasted on Halloween. God. Yeah. It would be like if Beyonce was just like, well, nobody liked my first record. <laughs> Like, yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't get it. But like the people who like this guy, D- Roseman, he he got out of it. And he he kind of found his way. But like the other these people who who, you know, who kind of like Ramey and Carpenter and all the people that we just mentioned, like they kept doing it because they were good at it. So, you know, I don't know. They can hate it all they like. I love this shit. See, that's why I am a huge fan of Vincent Price, because Vincent Price, he was not a horror actor. He fell into it sort of and got pigeonholed. And he was still like, you know what? It's fucking fun and I love it. So I'm going to keep making horror movies now because I have tons of fun and people seem to really like them. Yeah. Everybody's having a good time. That's why Vincent Price is the fucking bomb. Yes, he is. Yes. <laughs> All right. So cast. Uh, this has uh, Kate McNeil plays her final girl, uh, Katie or Catherine. Um, they, they kind of waffle on the name. Uh, she was a recurring villain on the soap uh, as the world turns for a few years. Uh, and that was even by the time she picked up this role, like she was kind of a known quantity. Uh, and then going forward from there, television was her primary scene. She's still quite active today. Uh, kind of picking up like, you know, guest spots and shit like CSI and stuff like that. I tell you what, if you are making a movie and you want something done right and fast, get a goddamn soap opera star. Right. It kind of worked on here because she's not the only soap. You get you get two of them in this one. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if you're a horror movie fan, actually, you get three of them. Really? Yep. Because I only know about like the woman who plays Vicky. Uh, Eileen, Davidson. Eileen Davidson. She actually Denise walked by while I was while I was watching this and she was like, oh, she was on Days of Our Life. I similar thing happened in my house. <laughs> but yeah, uh, she was also she was also on The Young and the Restless and Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Oh, no shit. No shit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you're a horror fan, then, you know, Kate McNeil uh, or you probably know her as the love interest in George Romero's uh, Monkey Shines. Which have you ever seen that one? Uh, we went to see the theater. 
you did because mom took me mom took me to see that movie no she took us to the movies you took us to see that movie (laughs) no 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 because i'll tell you this is this is a very fucked up situation because she got the book at some used book place and loved it and obviously yeah yeah it was adapted from a novel and uh obviously um the book was not as violent as the movie is and it probably doesn't include the sex scene and so I'm sitting there with, next to mom in this movie theater as that scene came up and she actually reached over and put her hand over my eyes. You'd think that the uh, key art for the film with a monkey holding a bloody <laughs> would have been a clue. I know. I mean, I mean, this is not the right. This is film. what happens when, yeah, this is what happens when George Romero, like gets his hands on the, on the, the, the material. Um, it's not as explicit as like Day of the Dead, which I think is the movie that he made before that one. So he must have got the gore out of his system with that one. But uh, yeah, Monkey Shines is not a terribly gory movie, but the sex scene is extremely explicit. <laughs> and yeah, it's a really fucked up thing to watch while you're sitting next to your mom in a dark movie theater. Um, uh, the third, the third sub star is uh, Harley Jane Kozak. Oh, OK. Plays, I, think, I think she plays Diane is the name of the she's character. The one, I think she's the one who gets killed first. Yeah, she's like the sardonic. She's the uh, the barb of the. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, the uh, let's see, the villainous house mother, Mrs. Slater, is played by a woman named Lois Kelso, who wasn't terribly active on screen. She's only done this picture. She did a TV spot. She had a small part in a Chris Rock movie. But her her she was like uh, when whenever we do these movies that were like definitely not shot in California, she's what we what we colloquially call local talent. Uh, she was a stage actress. Uh, from the D.C. area. This movie was made between uh, uh, Virginia and Maryland. Uh, so, And boy, does it show. Yeah, yeah. So her voice and was apparently dubbed for this, post, uh, this part uh, in post because it wasn't nasty enough. This whole, the whole movie, I think, is dubbed. Oh, yeah. Well, at least that one. I mean, if it is, it's that they did a hell of a job because I didn't even realize that that was the thing. I just sort of assumed that was her voice because it. Because I watched it with the mono audio track and it's a little bit off. Oh, gotcha. It's uh, yeah. I mean, it's possible that they just looped it all. Like they probably had like shit location sound or something. Uh, let's see. So Eileen, we mentioned her earlier. Eileen Davidson plays the awful killer Vicky. Uh, she was also a soap actress, as we said, Days of Our Lives, Young and the Restless. And she's actually won several uh, daytime Emmys for her work. So you know, good for her. And she's on two soap operas at the same time. Damn. She's still on them. She's fucking a busy woman. Uh, the, so regarding the girls in the sorority, this was the first and last picture for about half of them. Uh, and Robin Malloy, who plays my favorite of the bunch, Jeannie, is actually a professional musician of note. To, Jeannie? Today. Genie is your favorite. Huh? Genie is my favorite. Yeah, like so. This movie, like, have you ever seen Hausu, the Japanese movie? Uh, yes. So, yes. so everybody, everybody who watches that movie has got like a favorite house girl. And I, when I was watching this, I was like, oh, okay. So Genie is my kung fu because that was she was my is kung fu. The one who's eaten by the piano. No, I can't remember what her name is. Kung fu is the one who gets who who spends half the movie in her underwear and she kicks the cat picture, but just her lower body does. And it, yeah, Which I'd say we do Hausu at some point, Japan. But, but I don't know if we could ever actually cover that in a, in a sort of meaningful way. Toho made four horror movies. And then after that, they were like, you know what? No more. No more of this. <laughs> we're not we're not good at this. Yeah. This is not our thing. So uh, lastly, and I only mentioned this just because his, his role in the movie is meaningless. Uh, Michael Sergio, he plays Rick. He's Vicky's boyfriend who gives her the gun. And I only mention him because. A few years after this, he's the guy who who parachutes into Shea Stadium during Game Six of the World Series in 1986 when the, when the Mets played the Red Sox. That was the high point. Of, that was basically the high point of his of his entire career. It was probably uh-huh. a publicity stunt that just never panned out because he went to jail for it. Oh, I was going to say cocaine's a hell of a drug. That is true. Oh, uh, boy. Yeah. So a few notes. Uh, the body count in the movie totals nine, which is a respectable number. You still, you still skipped the music. You skipped no, the music I have not. Time. It's coming. We're talking All about right. that fucking soundtrack. Uh, yep. So a uh, respectable number. Uh, but the kills in this movie are seriously wimpy. The film's distributor asked for reshoots and additional gore, which is still very tame. I think they didn't have any money. I, it's probably it. So the movie cost about a half a million dollars. It grossed about ten million in the box office alone. Because if anything hurts this movie, it's it's 
not the lack of gore per se. It's more the lack of action. Yeah. Yeah. Because they obviously didn't have a lot of money for special effects because the special effects are fucking terrible. They're pretty, they're pretty bad. That's probably why they cut away from them so brutally, which we'll mention just because there's, there's, uh, that's the one, that's the one sort of tripping point that I get with this whole thing. IMDb trivia notes that the movie got nearly got an X rating, which I have a hard time believing. I think they all say that when it comes back to like DVD commentaries and stuff. Because if Maniac, damn waterbed. I know if Maniac and the Prowler skated by with an R rating, this movie could have gotten a fucking PG were it not for the nudity. The production designer on the picture is a guy named Vincent Piranio, who uh, who worked with John Waters as far back as Pink Flamingos. Uh, and most of their work together lands in that Golden Waters era of the late 80s to the mid 90s and like the Crybaby hairspray. I believe he also did a lot of TV. Yes, he did. And, he, and he, again, he's another guy who's still who's still working. He also worked on Serial Mom, which is a movie that we ought to get to at some point. Pussy Willows Dottie. The script supervisor in the movie is a woman named Richie, Rachel Talalay, who would go on to do a shit ton of TV here in the UK. Like, she's also still quite, quite active. And, like, if you're listening to this, she's probably directed something that you've seen. She's done, like, Doctor Who and The Flash and uh, some, some of the Disney Marvel stuff that they do for their, to their TVs. Uh, she also directed I've not, Fred. I've not seen any of them. Uh, well, she directed Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. I have seen that. Yep. So Rossman said that he was inspired by Clouseau, which is some fucking bullshit. Man, shut up. I know. Just shut the <laughs> get, fuck up. Get the up. fuck out. Get, what is this shit? The central conspiracy of the prank gone wrong and a hidden witness is shamelessly stolen from Prom Night. It is almost identical to the setup for or, Prom Night. Or every single slasher that is based on And Then There Were None. Uh, Yeah, yeah, that. But also, he'd clearly seen Black Christmas. Right up, yes, right up to the end. Heavy, heavy shades of Black Christmas. Yep. This. In, a, in a way that is not bad, because I will say, in an era, I mean, this is pretty much true of all horror movies, but horror is sort of notoriously misogynistic and creates kind of one dimensional female characters. These characters are pretty well developed as individual people. That's the thing. Like, each one of them's got a little bit of a personality, and like in the same way you that can the tell- Housu girls do. Well, and he's pulling that, obviously, from Black Christmas, where they all are distinct characters, or Halloween, where they're all distinct characters. Uh, so he does cite Bava as a, as a, uh, an influence, which I can definitely see for, for certain. Like he's, I can see a certain era of Bava, not across the board. Well, no, but like he, uh, you know, he, particularly towards the end, it's that very, like, the Technicolor era of Bava. Mm-hmm. Um so like, yeah, get the fuck out of here with that Clouseau shit. Yeah. The whole, the thing is, is that this movie, even though it's made in American and made in America by Americans, this movie felt more like a Jallo to me, which is probably yes. the, the, and then there were none quality to it. The only thing really, yeah, there's a, there's an Italian influence. Yeah. In yeah. Like thing. the only thing really missing from it is there's no fashion shoot going on, you know? Um, so now the score is composed by Grimbro's favorite Richard Band, who is gleefully stealing from Manfredini's uh, third Friday. Oh, I was going to say doing his best, uh, his, his best uh, Jerry Goldsmith. <laughs> the first time, yeah, this is actually a bit of like a, a pastiche. Like there's definitely yeah. some Jerry Goldsmith parts. There's some like spooky la 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 stuff. And there's a lot of yeah, that. There's a lot of that. That stabby, like, uh, uh, dun, 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 kind of stuff that, that Manfredini does in Friday the 13th. I love the fact that Richard Band shamelessly rips shit he off just all steals. the time. And he doesn't care. He doesn't. Like, and all of Reanimator, Reanimator is basically Bernard just Herman. psycho. It's, so, yeah. it's psycho. That's all it is. It's so great. Yeah, I know. I know. Like, the thing is, is I don't give a fuck, man. It's, it's No, he doesn't either. He's like, yeah, that's exactly what it is. I thought it'd be funny. He's so good. He's so good. And the music, and the, like, the music was actually like so he composed it and it was performed and recorded by the london philharmonic so like this is not like a nickel and this is that's where all your fucking money went yeah this is not your like like this is not a nickel and dime like final exam like it's definitely on par with something that was acting with a little bit more money and um yeah this is like lower to mid tier this isn't like don't go in the woods alone like this is a little bit elevated but not quite to yeah, like it's definitely it's definitely a director's first picture, but it doesn't it 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 definitely feels like something that came from somebody who is like way more accomplished. I will also tell you, you said that, uh, that prom night is an influence on this prom night. This beat out prom night for this particular pick for this week. Oh no, kidding! Uh, it was that, going to be prom no night shit, because you said I said that last time night. also. 
I, because I, I was trying to find a way to work it in gotcha. there, and I still will right. because it is a Canadian film, and I love Canadians. Prom night is, yeah, no shit. Same I, guy who made curtains. I had no idea. All right, so it is 1961, and it was a dark and stormy night because, of course, it is. Uh, we we open it up on some sort of a like a, a hospital where a woman is having difficulties with labor, and the uh, the doctor has to cut her open. It's a it's a dark and stormy black and white night. My version is tinted blue. Ah, I think that like so my my theory is that because they couldn't afford much uh, by way of uh, uh, special effects, they were like, OK, how do we make her look a little bit younger? Because she looks exactly the fucking same as she does later. What the thing is, is like going into this, I had really no idea what was going on. And so when they show the woman in labor, I'm like, that lady looks a little old to be having a baby. Yeah. And then I think I know why this pregnancy is risky. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, I mean, they, they do their best. But like when she shows up in the subsequent scenes, I'm like, oh, oh, my God. They just like, like put like a cowl over her head to sort of like, yeah. you know. But uh, yeah, so she is uh, she she's struggling and there's a little there's like a lot of chatter between like the doctor and the nurse and there's a lot of close ups on like a pregnant woman's stomach and then this woman like having a hard time. And the dialogue is super misleading. What it sounds like is she she asks, like, where's the like after it's all done and everything's kind of kind of quieted down. She asks where the baby is. The doctor is evasive and then she screams. So it sounds like the baby is lost. That's a reasonable assumption, yes. Except. Yeah, except. Uh, we we then cut to the present. That's titles over a montage set up uh, to set up our victim pool. And uh, there's a lot of close-ups, uh, montage of zany girl stuff happening. Over- yeah, this whole thing has like a vibe of everyone's getting ready to go on vacation. It really, it's almost like the that, that um, it really needed a song like in The Mutilator, that goofy like Billy Joel song, or it needed some kind of new wave like 80s kind of thing going on instead of the strings that we, that we get, the Jerry Goldsmith stuff. Yeah, my note just says, uh, this is ladies doing ladies. Stuff. <laughs> That's really what it is. They're like... They're like they they open up closets and like boxes of shoes fall out like it's uh you know it's it's over stuff they're like shaving they're like their laughing legs and, and shaving their legs yeah. like it's it's just lady stuff yep and uh Catherine is is uh we then finally we come to the thing we come up that we meet our final girl Catherine she's in her room she's packing up all of these girls have just graduated which is also part of the sort of establishing shots in the in the montage just they're all in their coat of caps and guns so like this is the last couple of days that they'll be in this sorority house. Catherine's getting ready to move out. Um, and her mother looks out the window and we see Chekhov's swimming pool. God, that's what my note says too. I know. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I knew we were going to, we were going to get one of those. Yeah. I mean, also that's kind of a, that's, that's sort of becoming an us thing. <laughs> along comes, along comes Vicky who sucks. Uh, yeah, they're they're about to smack you in the face with the Madonna whore dichotomy. Oh God, yeah, yeah. It, it because really is. I mean, Catherine could not look any more pure unless they put her in like a fucking Holly Hobby dress. She is dressed like like Little House on the Prairie for half of this movie. Meanwhile, Vicky is a sultry bitch the whole time. Oh, I know, I know. And th- this is the thing. Like, it really does kind of say something about the way that society received Halloween in the moment because like we talked about this last time and we're probably going to mention it every time we do a a slasher movie because it was so fucking ubiquitous in these movies was the final girl is always the chaste good girl and she is just surrounded by whores and it's just it's such a weird way to look at it because like I I'd never seen that until like Around the time that the, that book uh, was it Men, Women, and Chainsaws came oh, out, Men, Women, and Chainsaws. Yeah. Like, that was the first time that I think anybody had really ever used that word as "final girl," and we got that sort of assessment of like this is how people saw it. And I was like, "God damn, really?" And then I sort of went back and saw these movies, and I was like, "God damn, they really did sort of like think that like all of Laurie Strode's friends were just." itching to get killed for their transgressions and to them i say you can all fuck off because every <laughs> single one of them is a goddamn queen and they are amazing yeah, yeah. except for vicky fuck her uh, i kind of love vicky in this <laughs> because she is such a weird bitch she's she is she's wise beyond her years she she has an intensity to her like she you never she's either gonna have sex with you or she might stab you she might just rob you you never know yeah she is coming at you with both barrels, and I love it. Yep. 
So we that so again, uh, Vicky has set up Catherine with a blind date for like this big party, like big going away party. And so now we cut away back to the hotel, uh, not the hotel, the, the hospital, uh, and enter Mrs. Slater. She's the uh, she's the sorority house mother. Uh, and I had to look this up. Like, I had no idea what a house mother did. I was sort of vaguely aware of house mothers as a thing. Uh, Are you not familiar with Black Christmas? Yeah, because but that has the house mother to end all. House <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like the concept of a house mother, I was like, what the fuck even is a house mother? Because like you you only hearly hear about it in the in the context of sororities. Do they still exist? Is that a still a thing? Uh, I looked. I actually looked this up because I was like, "What the fuck is a house mother?" And it turns out that like not every sorority house has one. It really depends on the um, sort of the 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 laws that the school puts out for their whole like Greek system. So some schools require you to have like every every frat house or sorority house, or in some cases just the sorority houses. What they need is a resident advisor. And house mother is really kind of the colloquial name for that. Um, so they don't have to be a 70 year old lady. No, I read a story on one of them about a guy who like the, the, the RA in their frat house was the guy they bought all their weed off of. So like um, this is a stereotype essentially that we're, that we're getting surprised. It's, it's a great one. Yeah. A great one. Yeah. That. So she goes to the hospital that presumably we were at in the beginning uh, yeah, this whole scene has a real top men kind of quality. <laughs> it's it's it, it's it really hits you over the head. With, Everything is spoken in hushed tones. <laughs> yeah, uh, she stops to watch a little boy play with a sort of look of longing on her face. Uh, she goes in and she has a very short, very curt conversation with the doctor from the previous childbirth scene. And it's done in a very, again, the same ambiguous language as. The uh, is the opening establishing scene where the doctor is like your condi- the condition is worsening, um, you know this you ke- this can't keep up for as long like something you know something terrible is going to happen and she's like fuck you I'm I'm going ahead with it I'm closing the house on the nineteenth it's going to be fine don't worry about it so what we learn is that the the while the girls are planning on having this big party the uh, the house is supposed to be closed and my question is. If this all has to do with like behavior or some other sort of life threatening illness, why is she talking to a gynecologist about this? So, yeah, I I got a lot of questions about this doctor. I, I kind of feel like this is a unfinished plot. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the thing. When we get to it toward the third act, like when he he becomes a more prominent character, I feel like they slept on a lot of opportunity there to sort of make this a little bit more than it was. But I also get the feeling that they were running out of time and they were running out of money. Uh, so we kind of, we get what we get. So we cut again to Vicky and her boyfriend, Rick, who were climbing up into some kind of treehouse, maybe. Um, I think it's an old barn. <laughs> it's uh, when I looked at it, I was like, this is clearly a house that was built in tree. Like, this is like Swiss Family Robinson shit. But it looks like like the backstage area for maybe a theater that was built in a tree house. I don't know. He um, he gives her Chekhov's actual gun. I, th- I Everything about this is a bad idea. I don't know anything about guns. I know enough to know this is not how you handle them. Yeah, so what th- I was bristling a little bit because, like, I, I, I've used a gun uh, uh, in, of that uh, – that fashion before the 1911 uh it is a really really powerful gun it is extremely loud as well like that's what i whenever i see people using guns in these having actually like been at a range and like used firearms like i get the feeling that without the headgear that like dampens the noise i would be deaf after like five rounds and these people these two are like hanging. she's firing this thing off like fucking dirty harry and, and he's like licking her ear while she's doing like this is very dangerous yeah, like i don't think this is a good idea at all this is very improper gun safety but uh yeah we're gonna learn vicky don't give a this fuck. is what's wrong with america vicky <laughs> she don't give a fuck though as we come to find out. She really does she not. Doesn't. And that's kind of why I like her. Yeah. So uh, again, we cut. So this was, again, another sort of establishing scene. We're putting the gun in Vicky's hand. 
But they do this. They do this hard cut, and this is I don't know what if there's a name for this. It probably is. But oh, it's when yeah. they cut, they fire the gun, and it it coincides with the popping of a champagne cork. It's sort of like when someone gets their head cut off or something, and then it's like a splat of ketchup on a plate in a diner somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would love to know. I guarantee that that's got an industry name. I would love to know what it is because that's what it is. Is Vicky like fires another shot, but we hard cut to the girls in the dorm minus Vicky and they're all drunk and in their underwear. Cause that's, you know, and now you're going to meet them all. So good. Yep. We go around the, we go around the table. I, like I said, I'm team genie all the way. She's a little frumpy. There's uh let's see. I try to remember this. There's, she does have kind of a Mormon vibe. She is, because, like, the others are a little loose in there, the way that they dress, and she's always... I think she even, like, goes so far to have, like, a cross on at one point. Yes! But um, there's... Let's see. There's Liz. There's Donna? Is, is it Donna or Diane? Diane. That's... That's Harley Jane Kozak. She's she's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> she's my, actually, she's my she's my second favorite. You know who my first favorite yeah, is. Yeah. So we got we got Catherine also. Then there's Morgan, who's the kind Ooh. of kind of stupid one. I think that's kind of like her. She gimmick. watching Morgan, and I'm sure this is how she was directed to act. I am not going to assume that this woman is a bad actor, but. It is like watching someone have a stroke for ninety minutes. <laughs> <laughs> She's very childish. Yeah. In the in the greatest weirdest way. Yeah, yeah. So so let's see. So so Vicky's out. We got Catherine. We got Liz. We got Diane. We got Jeannie. We got Morgan. We, and there's one more. And her name is uh, I can't remember Stevie. Stevie. And each one of them does a little like like a toast to like you know hey to the future sort of thing, but it's a little jokey, and I can't remember which one of them it is. Uh, she's like, my dad says that I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but it was up my nose. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, yeah. Like this was this was before my they were coming in hot. This was uh, before Miami Vice and like Blow still had like celebrity status. Like they were still given like they're still putting it in High Times magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone had like a little coke spoon yeah. they kept around their neck so uh they, they what uh what we find out is okay because because as they're partying they're drunk they're all they're all drinking uh in walks mrs slater who all none of, the, none of these girls are even supposed to be there but yeah, she's, spoiler alert everyone mrs slater is a bitch about everything yeah she's a fucking hard ass and she's she's not mostly angry that they're still there she's angry that they're drinking and she basically calls them a bunch of like sluts like yeah she does to their face and this is not the last time she will do that. oh no 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 she is the roger ebert of movie movie character <laughs> yeah. roger ebert of house mothers yeah she if these, these girls don't give a fuck they know they're having this party whether she wants them to or not um, we find out it's because uh, they have to move it from their original location to the sorority house for lack of funds, probably because they spent all their money on coke. Because that drug's very expensive. We move to um, Mrs. Slater's room in the aftermath of this scene, and she's looking over. She's got like a wall of photos of like sorority house lineups in the past. And like in these pictures, like she looks like happy, you know, or at least, you know, like satisfied, maybe she doesn't like, she seems to sort of enjoy her role, but then she gets to the one of all of the girls and she, we are introduced to the deadliest fucking cane I have ever seen in a movie. Like it is topped with a cane topper. You could kill a werewolf with. Yeah. This seems like a bad idea for a cane. If Very you sharp. are wobbly Very and prone to falling down, a, a, a walking, a stick, that has not just a sharp end to the cane topper, but also the end of the cane is used on numerous occasions to stab these girls. Yeah, this is, it is the primary weapon of murder. Yep. I don't know if I would want... I just don't think that that's a very smart item to have, like, to steady myself with. I'm probably going to stab myself more than I'm going to, like, stay upright with it. We cut back to uh, the girl scene where... Uh, Vicky and Rick return to the to the sorority house and she's like, give me a second. I need to get ready for it. She goes up to her room and then he eventually comes up. And OK, I, I got to I got to interject here. I, see, I don't know much about women or, or what makes them alluring. But here's what I do know. 
She is on this waterbed trying to look uh, erotic, I'm guessing. She's just jiggling around <laughs> on a waterbed. And I'm looking okay. at this thing and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is not this is not doing what you think it's doing. So let me well, let me say, uh, as a dude who's into chicks, I'm into it. The undulating surface of the waterbed undoes the entire thing, though. So <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, 82 is- must have been a peak, like must have been peak waterbed season, because this is the second time in only eight episodes of this podcast where a waterbed has featured prominently uh, with sexual connotations in a movie. And that, of course, is the other one we did was Pieces, where uh, nothing is was it nothing is more beautiful than smoking pot. Uh, and there's fucking there's on nothing a waterbed. better. Yeah, the best things in life are yeah. fucking on a waterbed and smoking pot. I don't know something brilliant. Yeah, yeah. see, also pieces. Basically, it's 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 a good one. But I, and I, so I'm watching this. I'm thinking this must these things must have been featured in Playboy or something because they are the fucking worst. And they and they seem very they're like everywhere in these movies. Uh, also, Vicky's line at the end of that scene is supremely gross. She said, so like what I said was like, I'm into it. I was feeling it. When she said this, I was like, okay, I, you have a very unpleasant relationship with your father because she says, look what daddy bought his little girl. Ugh. Because here's the thing. I went and I looked up the history of waterbeds because I was interested in uh, like why this was such a thing that we're, we're encountering. And I found a really great article from The Atlantic in uh, 2002 about the rise and fall of the waterbed. This turns out, yes, they were in Playboy. Uh, they were invented in 1968. Uh, They were advertised in the 70s with lines like two things are better on a waterbed. One of them is sleep. Fucking and smoking pot. Yeah. Yeah. Could have been in could have been in in pieces. Um, It said that because uh, 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 original designs were filled with liquid cornstarch, which engulfed the people on the bed like the blob. Um, And they were. But the thing is, is they were designed originally with therapy in mind. So for comfort and relieving pressure points, because, you know, spring mattresses were the thing at the time providing better night's sleep, but because the 70s was gross, everybody's mind jumped at the thought of fucking on one. And having actually been on one, I'm really not sure how that works. No, I, it, it just seems impractical. And like also, you, where do you where do you find purchase? Like maybe everybody was just fucking super horny in the 70s because like the, the, how your mind just jumps to that conclusion because it is a wildly undulating surface under even the most optimal of conditions. Like it just... Like, I think this is what happened to this... Everyone is sexually repressed forever. And then all of a sudden in the late sixties, they don't have to be. And they're like, Oh my God, everything is sexy. That's and now we are, we are like 60 years out and we're like, okay, look, some things are sexy. Not everything. Some <laughs> things are just fucking gross and nauseating. Yep. Stop it. Yep. Yep. Grow up everybody. I know. Are we not adults here? <sighs> so who Vicky fucks on the water, man. And uh, Mrs. Slater demonstrates the deadly nature of the cane on the waterbed. And it's set up like a scene where, like, the killer is coming to get her. uh, Now, her reaction, it just seems way outsized here. Like, I mean, sure, Vicky's been a bitch, but, like, she comes at her with that cane like she's going to kill her. Super, super oversized reaction. But again, what we just heard in the sort of establishing scenes at the hospital is, uh, you know, psychotic reactions. You know, you're, you're heading to a break sort of thing. So we're to assume yeah. that Mrs. Slater is like she has some sort of mental condition that's just getting worse. Also, uh, this scene wouldn't be nearly as dramatic if it was just like a regular mattress. Wouldn't it even happen. Nope, probably. Nope. I mean, that thing would have got hooked up on the springs or it would have been like a comedy thing where it was like one of those ones that was just like mythically sealed with like down feathers in it and would just put feathers going everywhere. It just it wouldn't have worked the same way. But it was just like in pieces where fucking water goes everywhere. So the next day, the girls are all out by that nasty ass pool. The thing that I, I completely. And what, and what are they doing around that nasty ass pool? They're, they're eating fried chicken out of a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. God damn, man. The fucking 80s. I know. I know. God, you know, I tell you what, I do kind of miss the old KFC buckets, but um, you could probably still get one. I mean, I, I don't I recommend so. it. It's probably not good for you, but. Oh, no. I mean, of course, not. it's fast, fast food fried chicken. But the thing that I completely skated by when I talked about, we talked about Chekhov's swimming pool is this pool. It's not just a swimming pool. It is a fucking swamp. It's gross. Uh, it's Which green. raises questions later on. I know. Uh, so it's green. It's got all kinds of shit floating on the surface of it. It's really, really nasty. Nobody wants to go in it. Um, the girls are all 
pissed off about the way that Mrs. Slater has been acting and Vicky in particular, like she's really upset about this waterbed. And a matter of fact, like one of the other girls is like, can't you fuck somewhere else? And she's like, she just came in and destroyed my <laughs> water. I love that though. Yeah. She came and in. She's and- just like, what got Vicky? Fuck like a normal person. <laughs> See, she's thinking ahead. Yeah. She's future oriented. She's like, it's not all sexy all the time. Yep. Come on, Vicky. Yep. They, and so they all, they're all like, okay, yeah, we'll just do an old fashion sorority prank on her. And they all start brainstorming <laughs> the most banal shit. Like, what if we put a bucket of water over her door and it'll fall down on her when she walks in the door? Or what if we light a bag of dog shit on fire? And, and Vicky is like, Vicky has a different idea. Vicky, what if I shoot her in the chest? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is <laughs> hilarious old prank, just like the school shooting prank oh, in no. Final Exam. Oh, my God. The similarities between these two movies are, are really playing out. But the thing is, is in the moment, Vicky doesn't really even say what her plan is. She goes, I got it. And and the and she looks at the other girls who kind of argue a little bit. And then she's like, well, are you with me or not? And I'm thinking it would be helpful if you said what your plan was. Uh, but it cuts it cuts to. um uh, the next scene where they're all sort of handling the gun, like Vicky is is passing it around, and they're all like scared of it. Obviously, like they've never they've never handled such a thing, and so we still at this moment we still don't know what Vicky's plan is, uh, but it it involves a gun apparently. Uh, so the next morning, Mrs. Slater wakes up, and she turns to her little like cane holder, and the cane is missing. And so she goes down to where the girls are all down at the pool and Vicky is turns into a fucking bond villain in this, in this scene where she reveals that the cane is floating on like an inner tube in this disgusting pool on the fucking grossest old timey inner tube I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. It looked like it was like, it was from a truck from the thirties. Like it, it's yeah. yeah. Uh, and she's like, so go get it. And Mrs. Slater's like, fuck you, you go get it. And this is when Vicky pulls the gun on her and everybody kind of like shuts up for a moment. And so Mrs. Slater doubts the authenticity of the gun to which Vicky turns and fires it at like a lamp and and breaks the light, you know, with the bullet. And so uh, keep, keep that in mind. I want to come back to that as well. Oh, I think you're thinking what I'm thinking. So the... <laughs> She then points it back at uh, Mrs. Slater and all the, what is it? There's a, there's a bit of a struggle. And then she shoots, Vicky shoots one of the girls in the leg who has a, a wound now, or so it seems. And then, uh, so that's Stevie who gets shot. And then the thir- and then finally Mrs. Slater is like in the pool. She's been sort of tricked into this. And then again, they shoot, Stevie, who gets hurt, and so she comes up out of it, and then Vicky turns and shoots Mrs. Slater, but nothing happens to her. And then there's a bit of a struggle and a tussle for the gun, and the the gun goes off, and Mrs. Slater gets shot in the fucking chest and dies from a gunshot wound. Classic prank. Classic stuff. So let's go over the sort of contents of this gun's magazine, because the first shot was a live round, apparently. The second shot was a blank. The third shot was a blank. The fourth shot was a live round. And she says later, I didn't know there would be another round in the gun. And I thought to myself, why are there just a mix of blanks and live rounds in this gun? It's a very risky proposition. This is a very poorly planned prank. Yeah. But Mrs. Slater is, like, legit de- dead. Like, she's just dead. There's no, like, death scene or anything like that. Like, she she falls into the pool. The girls go and get her. And Katie, Katie, who was dressed like fucking Cindy Brady, <laughs> she is having none of this. Yes. She's the one who's like, I'm going to go and do the right thing. I'm going to go call an ambulance. And all of the girls are like, wait, we're going to get in trouble if you do that. Yeah, one of them is like, what about my job at Pan Am? I, I know. Like, Jesus. Yep. You got weird priorities. <laughs> so... They they proceed to cover this up hastily. Uh, they, they yeah, she says one of them says, "Go and get as many towels as you can." Yeah, and, and the girl runs into the house and comes back with two towels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you ran into a house, a sorority house full of people, and you found two towels. Yep. 
So they wrap her up in the towels, they tie her up, and they they throw her into the pool, and she sinks. And then the girl just as the band, just as the band is arriving, yeah, just as the band is right, and the, they send Morgan to to stall the band. And my note just says, "Oh no, don't send Morgan. She's an idiot." <laughs> <laughs> yep. They, they, so they roll her into the swimming pool, and she sinks. And then they all walk away. And then because you know physics being what they are. Mrs. Slater resurfaces. Uh, and now it's party time. Get our cars ripoff band. I actually call them, uh, I call them uh, Great Value Sparks. Yeah, it reminded me of, hey, who here likes the Doobie Brothers? Because we got <laughs> one of them. <laughs> yep. So, uh, but before, before, like, there's, there's a whole, like, establishing shot. The party's going on. It's packed. We got this band playing. Everybody's dancing. And we go back outside, and it's nighttime now. And somebody out by the pool recovers the cane and tosses off the blankets that Mrs. Slater was wrapped in, which is a con, which causes a continuity error that you probably, you'd only notice if you're me, but whatever. Uh, but yeah, we cut back in. This is a band called four out of five doctors. Who's They're a real band. Yeah. Whose Wikipedia page was very clearly written by a member of the band, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, they also appear in the movie, the boogeyman. So this isn't even the first horror movie that they've been in. Wait, which one? Not the, not the, uh, the boogeyman is the, 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 the American, the American one. boogeyman. Yeah. Okay. Um, that movie fucking sucks. I have, I, that's another one that I haven't seen. I've been, it's, it's been real garbage. Yeah. Um, their, their music is available on Spotify. It's not bad. Um, they're, yeah, they're just a cars. I said, yeah, they, they're kind of like the cars and big star at the same time. Like that's, that's really their thing. Um, so now, you know, this is the things are things are ramping up. There is a rando party goer who's just wandering around through the bushes. Now, this scene doesn't make any sense. Does not make like, any sense. What? Who is he talking? Who is he talking to? He's the only one and, there. Hey, you got. He's talking about like squirrels like, biting his dick. Yeah, it's like you got to look out for squirrels. Like, and then and then he gets stabbed in the throat, or rather, a a fairly convincing dummy of him gets stabbed in the throat. Yeah, what is arguably the most violent scene in the movie? I actually, I think Jeannie's death takes that, but this is also up there. We cut back to the party and now enter Peter. God, Peter, Peter is like a... Peter sucks. Peter is like a late motif that nobody asked for. He, he's, they think he's Catherine's blind date. He's the guy that Vicky set her up with. And he, for just, I, for just no real reason... He just sucks. He's like, there's nothing really particularly shitty about him. His behavior is appropriate at times and completely like inappropriate at others. He, he just keeps entering into the scene. His job in the movie is essentially being told to fuck off by Catherine. Like that's the whole, that's the, all he does in this movie. Uh, like Peter, nobody wants you here. Read the goddamn room. <laughs> yeah. And so he comes up and this scene is about, this is a blind date. This scene is about as, as real life awkward as an actual blind date. I think he's supposed to be a MacGuffin. I really can't be sure because otherwise I don't know what the point of this character is. Um, his role. In, probably because someone was like, Hey, you know, you've got no dudes in this movie. That could, now to, to that, I say, thank you. <laughs> yep. Their response seems to be okay. Here's Peter. Yep. Uh, so we, then we cut out to back down towards the pool and crazy party hijinks are ensuing. Uh, so here's my question. Here's where I'm getting to questions about this one. Yeah. I don't understand why these dudes want to get in the pool. No, this is before that. This is when, oh, wait, this when, is the, this the, is when they're going to throw her Yeah, in. this is when all the girls okay. run down to the pool and those two guys have Jeannie by the legs and the arms. They're swinging her like they're going to throw her into the pool. Now, this is basically just assault. I think this scene is supposed to be funny, but to it me, is not. it comes off as wicked rapey. Like it's, they are attacking this woman. Yeah, like and her, her skirt's like way up around her chest and shit. And like she's not in on the fun. Uh, and the only way they get them to put her down is saying, wet t-shirt contest inside. To that I say, kill these guys too. Oh, I know. If only like if only they had also walked into the bushes. But yeah, they stopped that. And then one of them, one of the girls This killer is killing the wrong people. <laughs> I know. I know. Really. Kill Vicky. Maybe leave the rest of them alone. But there's a They're whole house full, full of, of shitty dudes. Terrible dudes, I guarantee. 80% of those guys have rohypnol in their pockets. 
And they're all in their 40s. Seriously, every one of them's got like a shitty like porno mustache. They all look, yeah, it, it, yeah they, they all just got off of work at the factory, basically. Yeah, this is high 70s. Yeah. This is not, this is not glossy, shiny, you know, Nagel 80s. <laughs> yeah, you gotta wait for 84 for like university and college students to start looking like college students. Yeah, this is like years. washed out pinks and like Easter colors and tan everything. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of earth tones. Avoc- Fucking earth tones. <laughs> like avocado. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the girls gets pushed into the pool and all of them are like, oh, my God, we got to make sure that nobody turns on the pool lights. So this is the first one where they, you know, we separate one of the girls so that she can meet her doom. So Stevie goes to the spooky basement to pull the breaker on the pool lights in case anybody just tries to turn them on. Uh, and... While she's down there, a creepy ass ball rolls out of the darkness to distract her. Um, and then like she does that thing that everybody does where they're like, who is that? You know, they like look mm-hmm. down in the darkness and then in silhouette, she gets killed. Yeah, Stevie, it doesn't matter who it is. Yeah, pull, Get out. Pull the fucking breaker and leave you. Yeah. Yep. That's me. That's slasher movie frustrations. Uh, for her troubles, she is uh, stabbed numerous times with the cane. In silhouette. You don't actually see that one at all. Um, and then we go back up to the place where the band is playing, and they're doing some kind of fucking Sadie Hawkins thing in this in I, this scene. This scene is so weird because it's like you, you are a bunch of 45-year-old men and maybe 20-year-old ladies, and now you're doing this weird ladies' choice sorority dance that's like kind of like that weird wedding tradition that's a little bit creepy. Yeah. It's like the like, hey, what, what is this? Yeah. What's going on? This, and also, this had to be like an artifact of the time, like a leftover of a previous era, because the, there's a lot of slasher movies that use this um, kind of setup for uh, just like a, a body count pool, like a victim pool. The Prowler does it. My Bloody Valentine does it. Yeah, this but the one, Prowler is like antiquated. It takes place in the like 40s no the prowler takes place now but a part of it takes place in the 40s uh but my bloody valentine does it also like it's it seems to be a thing that was just like way more common like probably after world war ii probably up until about the 70s because like we i i don't remember that like there were like schools like middle school and high school dances and i don't think they even do that anymore my bloody valentine just has a dance scene it doesn't have anything weird about it Oh, true. But I mean, that that is kind of the whole like the whole all the killing sort of surrounds that that whole thing. That's really the point I'm trying to make is. is Yeah, it's... the dance, this very structured dance yeah. is very strange to me because like I, I did not I, I did not have a traditional high school experience and, and I did not go to dances. Yeah. But uh, if I had, I think I would have been put off if they were this fucking weird. Yeah, it's it's. God, it really is. It's very weird. Because it's basically just like, hey, uh, here's compulsorily uh, heterosexuality. Just smash these people together. Yeah. And Come it's, on, get out there. It's, it's, you're, I, I kind of get the feeling like things are kind of moving back in that direction these days. Like everything is is getting a little bit more conservative. Um, it wouldn't be surprised. Like they're like, they're, they're, they're like outlawing like girls from wearing suits to prom and shit. Like it, this whole thing is, is a fucking mess. It's really gross. You know, even though, like, I'm sure that when you the people who went to see this movie were like, oh, sure, we did that once, you know. Without ever thinking, yeah, but it was pretty fucking weird when you did it, too. Yeah. yeah. So now we go back to the pool and this is where there's like three just rando dudes in their underwear about to jump into this gross pool that they're definitely going to get. A disease from like if you- and the the only thing I can think is that they were trying like how do we raise the specter of the pool again yeah. because how do you do it without without it feeling kind of heavy handed and this is about as heavy handed as you could possibly be but like they were just like well, it needs to be a threat again how do we do that yeah. it's like I don't know maybe a bunch of dudes in their underwear want to get in the water right why because <laughs> the breaker did not get pulled the lights in the pool are still sort of an ongoing problem and this is the thing about the movie is I actually feel like this movie's it's not great at pacing but there are other movies of the era that definitely drag in places and are much more egregiously like slow. 
this one kind of moves along and like nothing really happens without a reason. And so this is just to sort of remind you, Stevie got killed. She didn't pull the breaker because now they turn the lights on and all the girls run down there. And there's that, that one, the one fat guy jumps into the pool and announces, I'm a sea pig. Sea pig. And that's when all the girls run down and they turn on the but lights. But then he the looks pool. at them and he's just like, uh, I'm a sea pig? <laughs> Question mark? Yep. Just a, just a little bit like, of what? college. They don't even know what you're talking about. College hijinks. Who even are you, Mr. Sea pig? <laughs> yeah. But you couldn't pay me to fucking jump in that pool. But what we find that's out. That's what I mean. It's like, why would they look at that and be like, you know, what's going to be really funny is if we get into our underwear. And we get in this fucking disgusting pool. That'll be real hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. But, Will it? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, but they turn on the pool lights. And what we find is that Mrs. Slater's body's not in the pool anymore. Again, I think this is another scene where Catherine's like, this is out of control. I'm going to call the authorities. And Vicky is like. Over my dead body, you will. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We end up back in the kitchen for this one. Yeah. And this is when Morgan kind of tearfully wanders off. And she goes to... Her. I'm sorry, are you... Did you just skip over the greatest part of the movie? Uh, did I? When they're all in the kitchen and they're like, ah, oh, I... You can't do that. We call the police. It'll ruin our lives. And my note just says that uh, Katie needs to take about 20% off the acting. At this point. <laughs> um, she's she's definitely like soap opera acting in a, in a conventional yeah. Hollywood. Yeah, she's picture. she's doing it for the back rows at this point. <laughs> yeah. And one of them says something about like, well, if she's still alive, what if she's still alive? Oh, right. And then Morgan, Morgan says she stops and in the most earnest way possible, says, how do we know she is alive? And it is the weirdest fucking moment in any movie ever. My, my, my note just says Morgan's supposed to be the stupid one, right? Well, it, I, now, this, so this line is, you obviously do not know, this line is kind of iconic. I did not. Um, yeah, it is. It, it is for some weird reason because it's, it's not a matter of acting and, the, f- the inflection points are right. Yeah. But it's like they're overemphasized in a way that's like she was trying to emphasize the how do we know she is alive? Right. Yeah. But it's the tone of voice that's just like, why do you sound like Kermit the Frog? <laughs> why are you speaking so slowly? What the hell is going on? They don't really give Morgan much to do in the movie, right? Like she doesn't have a whole lot of spoken lines. So maybe she was like, yeah, okay. So, something tells me she's not a great actor. She's, yeah, her whole thing in this movie is she's there to basically do that one line and then undress. And thank God. Or both, I guess. <laughs> she, uh, so, yeah. So now she is the, I don't know if this is her room or this is Mrs. Slater's room because this is where that attic door is. Unless they got an attic door in like every closet in the house. But she's in there singing like the sorority song, like very sadly, very tearfully as she like takes all these like clothes off the rack. Oh, yeah. Because they're supposed to make it look like she's like, go up. Vicky tells her to go upstairs and make it look like uh, Mrs. What's Her Face. Uh, has is like packed in left. Gotcha. Okay, so that's that's why she's she's, she's in her room. room. In her room. And so as she's doing this, the attic door is like opening a little bit and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. And then we switch to like a POV of the attic door opening and something uh, coming at her, descending on her. And we cut back. We we uh, we find out that when all the girls are up there, that this is Mrs. Slater's body, which is still wrapped in towels in spite of the fact that we saw like, you know, like that shit I pointed out earlier where like somebody had unwrapped her basically. Um, Cause we're supposed to think that it's her who's stomping around killing all these girls. Still, we get a little bit more cheap nudity uh, right before Morgan gets it. And this is when she's got, she has the uh, like the toy. Yeah. Uh, what is that? The Jack in the box yeah. thing. And she, she is so genuinely delighted by this I thing. Know. And then she seems so surprised when the thing pops up out of the <laughs> thing. That's a Jack in the box. And it's like, bitch, what did you think was going to happen at the end of the song? Like, this is not a new concept. I know. Yep. That's, that's our, that's our Morgan. Oh, she's a little, man. she's a little simple. Uh, but and she puts yeah. on like this kind of sexy bolero outfit yep. to go to bed, I guess. Maybe. I mean, the party is still in full swing down there. Like, I don't know. I mean, maybe like a dead body dealing with this, like this, this conspiracy has got to put it on you. So, yeah, she puts on some sexy shit just to get murdered in it. She gets run through again by the cane from behind. 
God, the deadliest shame. fucking cane in the world. So now the plan is they're going to move Mrs. Slater's body to a nearby cemetery. So to get her there, they need to get it to a car and they argue over whose car it's going to be uh, before. I can't, I can't remember Diane uh, or Liz. One of them goes off. I think it's it. Liz. Well, so it's Liz there. It's Liz's car. Cause she keeps saying like, Oh, she I just, throws her. She throws Diane the keys yeah, and she's just like, I just got it or something. Yeah, don't, don't spoil it. Cause what I want to, I want to okay. get to it. Cause the, the reveal, the, the <laughs> cause reveal when I got there, I was like, wait a minute. The, what? <laughs> the reveal of the car is like one of my favorite parts of the entire movie. Um, so what the girls do is they, they, Jeannie's like, here, we'll put her in this. And it's like a dumpster. So they put her. They point to it and she goes, Vicky goes, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> How is a giant dumpster perfect? I, I would have, like, even just, even putting aside just the fact that they're, they're dealing, they, they murdered this woman, or rather, Vicky murdered her and they're covering it up. I would have real problems, like, putting a woman's body in the garbage. Just, I don't know, but like, this is not a genius proposition. So, but that, I think that's kind of what makes them all sort of likable is like, these are bumbling idiots from the, <laughs> the moment this the, movie begins the and it Keystone never cops, stops. The Keystone cops of murder. Uh, they really are. Uh, yeah. But um, so now we break. Catherine has gone into the attic where. You know the the with the, like a giant old timey candlestick. Yeah, it's like in uh, it's like in Butcher Baker like, where she's got like this candelabra. It's just going through the a flashlight. It's nineteen eighty one. It's not like they don't have them either because we've seen like them walking around with flashlights. But she finds out that like the the attic is like um, there's toys and shit all over the place. It's made up like a child lives there. And she finds a birthday card made out to someone named Eric, signed lovingly from mother. Um, she also finds Chekhov's Harlequin costume, which is an adult, yeah. adult sized costume of like, a, which is also, it's the Harlequin costume is a recreation of what's in the Jack and the right. Box. It matches the Jack in the box. So, which I feel like that's, that has to be a custom piece. And this lady, she paid for that. I know. She's just a house mother. I, and I don't mean to say that dismissively. I don't know how much money they make, Unless, but I'm guessing it's not enough for a custom Harlequin uh, costume. Maybe she made it herself, you know, for an adult baby. An adult. I, I don't even know a, what that costs. Full grown baby. <laughs> <laughs> um and she finds it there hanging there and like i said it's it matches the jack in the box and this is where here comes peter again so as this is happening peter has kind of come and gone throughout the situation where like when he first shows up catherine is very distressed this is right after the the murder has happened and he's like Maybe this is a bad time. Hey, this is like weird for me to I'll leave. And and Catherine's okay, like good. Yes, Peter. Yeah, right. This was you follow your instincts, bro. And Catherine's like, no, your no, no, date no. has been absent all night long. Yeah. And so she, I think that pretty much tells the story. Yeah. And so she's like, no, 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 stay, please stay. And it's like, all right, you know, like this. But then he's he's shown up a couple of times. They dance a little bit. And he's like, Hey, I'm having a great time. Ain't you having a great time too? He's not scuzzy. He's not sleazy. He seems like an uh, like an okay guy. He's just fucking feckless. He's just he's yeah, no. He idea. just sucks. Like I feel like I feel like if if I was hanging out with Peter every time I turn around, like Peter, what are you still doing? <laughs> Like, it is two o'clock in the morning. I went to bed two hours ago. I, Why are you in my living room? I know. Now he. This is like the second time he's sort of just lurched into the scene, and this will be the second time that she has said, "You need to go. You need to just get out of here." And he keeps fucking. And he going. says his line says he walks in the room. He's like, "Ah, oh, this is a neat room." And it's like, this okay, is a, no, it is not this a, is a neat, terrifying room, room. This is like one of the rooms from the fucking. This is like something out of out of a Nightmare on Elm Street. Like, uh, this is where a killer lives. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah, and like he, he's like, hey, oh, you starts riding on one of the toys. He's like, this was used to be my favorite. And again, she says, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, she's basically like, Peter, I think you need to go home. And my note actually says, Jesus, Peter, go home. Because <laughs> he's going to keep showing up. Um, they both notice a dead bird in a birdcage, which. Oh, so I got a couple questions about this bird. That bird is very clearly recently dead. Yeah, because it's all like so red blood. If if there's a bird in the attic, birds make a lot of noise. Yeah, they hadn't noticed. I don't know if you've ever, also, if you've ever been outside before. No, but. You know, occasionally. Um, also, birds live a long time. So that bird has yeah. presumably been there for a while. Yeah. So my question is, how have they never heard it? Yeah. Who is feeding it? 
Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, as we find out, Eric's not there all the time. He's only there in the summers. Because he's in the Indiana Jones facility the rest of the year. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So now. Where they Di- all talk in hushed tones about Diane mistakes go- made in the past. Yep. Diane goes to get Liz's car, which turns out to be a serious <laughs> 70s style custom yeah. fuck van. Like, I want a fucking wizard on the side of this van. It, it may as well have. She's got, uh, like, a CB radio that has, like, a, a full... Yeah, there's a fucking sight gag with the the CB radio <laughs> falls down and spooks it. Like, why is this girl, this, like, hot young sorority girl, this is a driving van. this fucking van? This van belongs to a man in his 30s who hangs out at, like, one particular discotheque in town and still gets ass with it. Like, this, this van does not belong long in the possession of like a- either that or like a man in his 50s who has or possibly maybe has not kidnapped a woman <laughs> yeah, he, yeah when he does that he goes, but odds are good that he has he goes in the back and he just like makes like ships and bottles and shit like it's it's such yeah. a fucking weird artifact like it's very clearly okay we need a car for liz and they're like can we borrow a car from somebody and one of the pas went like, yeah, a buddy of mine has a has a car. I'll be right back. And he shows up with this thing. And that would be perfect in like. And they were like, we don't have any more time. We're going with this. Yeah. But she talks about it like it's a fucking trans am. Like may, she's just like, no, this, thing might as well this is been. my T-top hot fucking car. <laughs> and, and it is not. Nope. It is not that at all. No. But oh, my God, the revelation of this van. I went, I, this was like, like, like the wedgie picking scene in final exam. I, I had to like, I had to like go back to the original scene to make sure that this van like belonged to one of the girls because like, it just doesn't make sense in the context of the rest of the movie. It's so, see, this is how this movie gets you is the more you talk about it, you're like, you know what? This movie's fucking great. <laughs> Oh, it's so great. It's it's just it's the peak moment of the entire movie. I cherish yeah. this scene. Uh but yeah, I think everything from this point on is why I love this movie. <laughs> it does, it does, it you know what? It does get way better because we're we are kind of rounding the the corner into the third act. Like the murders are ramping up. Cause this is a scene, I think that's Liz who goes to get the car. She gets killed by some unseen assailant um above her. Oh no, it's um or maybe it's uh, Diane. Diane. Because she gets stabbed through the sunroof or whatever yeah. in the hand. And the hand is like, clearly someone just sort of made this thing out of clay. Yeah, yeah. Because it is there's like. no is, blood. There's no blood. No. Also, nothing. when the guy in the bushes who's like, who's, who gets stabbed in the neck, like they went to all that trouble to make that like pretty good like mold of this guy's body. And there's no blood when he gets stabbed. Like surely they could have done something. That's because they use it all for the head and the toilet. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the girls are now pushing the dumpster towards the garage where the van is. Uh, but Which they- this is where the movie, you're like, what? what is going on? Why are they pushing a dumpster with a body in it? Couldn't she What's have, happening? Couldn't she have just driven up to get the body? Or, I, I don't know, something else. But, like, I don't know why they did this. Oh, because their whole plan, I don't think you mentioned this, their whole plan is... They're going to bury the body in the cemetery. Yeah, yeah, because that's the thing is that there's a cemetery right nearby. They're going to go, they're going to do it. They need to move it to the van to get to the cemetery. But this whole dumpster plan is very convoluted. But they push it into a cop's car and he almost, in the scene, this is a real, they could have lost this scene and have yeah. have been have been richer for it but like he almost opens it. I, it's, I guess it's just tension building or whatever cop almost opens it to find the body just before he turns the lights on and gets out of the car genie runs off yeah, this is like another sea pig moment where you're just like ah oh, you're almost caught yep. nah. yeah so genie goes uh she's attacked on her way into the house by the killer who now like he gets a couple of shots on her and she's she gets away, but also the killer drops this like emergency bracelet. Like, you know, if, you know, if in an emergency call this number sort of thing, which is, um, a, it's a prop that's set up at the hospital earlier on in the movie, like way, way, way earlier in the movie. But that just, that just hits the ground. Jeannie, yeah. The emergency bracelet is about to go off in the third act. Yeah. So Jeannie gets away. She runs into Catherine. Who's like, now Jeannie's like traumatized by this. She's a little cut up. Uh, Catherine leaves her to get help, of course. 
And then she's chased by the killer who comes into the sorority house. She runs into a bathroom and hides into stall. You know, scene that plays out almost exactly like the restroom scene in Maniac. Mm-hmm. See your episode about Maniac. I think there's also uh, there's a, a scene in Prom Night that's very similar to this. Uh, yeah. And uh, the killer, of course, finds her. She's she's sitting like on top of the toilet with her teeth, with her feet up. And she's got a big fucking knife that she brought her. So she's ready. So the killer finds her and she lunges at them, but they get the best of her and they basically pin her to the wall with a knife. And there's a huge like blast of blood and like this. Yeah, this is the only death that's actually pretty violent. Yeah, yeah. Like and that's what I said. Like this is, I think this is probably the the most like violent and most explicit of all the of all the kills uh, in the entire movie. But um, here's Peter again. We cut back to to Catherine, who's now in. The kitchen, she's going to call the cops, and Peter's like, oh, well, they'll want to talk to your house mother, right? And that's enough to, like, stop her in her tracks and be like, oh, well, yeah, maybe everybody's back at the party, or maybe they all left or something. So she's trying to, like, not address the the house mother situation. But once again, she says, Peter, go the fuck home. Yeah, she explicitly says, Peter, I think you should go home. And he looks so hurt by this. Yep. And it's like, dude... She has been your date for 15 minutes tonight. Yep. You have not seen her. You have spent more time with other people at this party than you have with the I get the feeling date. that maybe... You can't look hurt. Maybe there maybe there was a whole, like, subplot involving Peter that just got cut during, during post-production. Well, thank fucking and God, all they did was, was just leave these scenes in. Because, yeah, but here's, here's a spoiler. He doesn't go home. Nope. Nope. We're dealing with Peter. We're dealing with Peter for a while. Like right after that happens, she stops out. She's outside now. She finds that like emergency bracelet that she recognizes as Mrs. Slater's. Um, And so she calls the number on it. And it's the doctor from the top men hospital earlier and the sort of establishing scene. And like this just this she calls it and it just goes to his phone, like his desk phone. Uh, Apparently, yeah. Uh, and he's and also it's like we've uh, the, the scene, and he's working at midnight the scene with the cop establishes that it is like one it is quarter to 2 a.m. And this guy is still working because he answers and he comes running. And right when he's when he arrives, who's that in his car passed out? But it's fucking Peter again. Yeah. So he shows up and um, it's exposition time, basically. What turns out, what we what we find out is, and I'll tell you what, this 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 misdirect actually worked on me the first time. Like the whole time, I was like, "Who? Like who is the killer? Is it actually is Mrs. Slater really alive? Is it?" Oh, because they keep up the "is Mrs. Slater alive" thing until like the end of the movie. Uh, yeah, yeah, because there is uh, there's a For scene. reasons that don't make any no, sense. No, no, there is a scene coming up where we finally firmly establish that she is dead. She is one hundred percent dead. But even then, he says, she's still alive. He does? Yeah. Oh. I don't know why he says it, but. No, oh, because, yeah, they, they unwrap her and it's her body still. Yeah, she's clearly dead. Yeah. But the first time that I watched this, I had no idea. It, I, it, it just kind of goes to the movie's quality and the way that it really is kind of like pretty snappy in its storytelling and. Um, or either that, or I'm just a really credulous movie viewer and I'll just go along with anything. But like when I'm sitting here thinking like after she re- finds the birthday card, I'm like, oh, so is Mrs. Slater crazy or is there really this killer? That's when the ice started to thaw a little bit. But like right up to this point, I was like, oh, shit. OK, so this Eric is really the killer. So, hey, good on you, House and Sorority Row. You'd- I would have welcomed an old lady killer. I, and I mean like a killer who is an old lady, oh, not yeah. a killer of old ladies. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. But uh, he gives her the rundown. There's a tough delivery, but she actually has the baby who is the product of some kind of fertility experiment that's like controversial and like done on the sly by this doctor who is then like he was born with certain abnormalities and he doesn't go into detail. And I feel like they really slept on that because when Eric is sort of like properly introduced introduced to the story. We only really get a fleeting glimpse of him. It's almost like the end of final exam, like over again, where like Eric is really uh, red herring. It doesn't fucking matter. Like 
it, it works in the context of the story. It would have been nice if they just gave us a little bit more. But it turns out he's except in final final exam. It's it, it is literally nobody. At least in this, it's like you know who he's supposed to be. It's just who he is doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a little. Uh, yeah, it's it's a little Jason Voorhees-ish, you know, like maybe yeah. that's where they got the beats from. Because um, he's supposed to be like when we do see him, like we see him for like literally like a second. Um, and there is something about his appearance that's off, but you really can't tell because he's kind of hidden in the gloom. Um, and because they didn't have any money. So, yeah, they really don't want you to look at it too closely. Yeah, I mean, they do. They do go out of their way because to- they do eventually show him. And it's like, oh, come on. <laughs> well, they put him in the Harlequin costume. No, you see his face. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I was saying is you get that like one second glimpse of him. And he's just, again, like there's something going it's on. It's like when you see Michael Myers face, and you're like, oh, it's just a dude. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yep. And like in the the recent ones where they, they pull his mask off and he's just like some old guy with male pattern balding. And I'm like, fuck, man, <laughs> I know how it feels, bro. Yeah. So this is a big info dump where they're just like, Eric is real. He He lives at the institution throughout the year but when the house is closed and everybody goes home mrs slater comes and gets him and they they he lives in the house but she still keeps him in the attic like uh which look i i'm not gonna i don't want to call anybody out for anything here but mrs slater is really fucking judgmental throughout this whole movie (laughs) yeah she is also being inappropriate it's not okay for her to be bringing her crazy son to live in the weird murder attic. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, it's totally, it's, you know. it's like, it's almost, it's like that treehouse of horror where there's like a mutant version of Bart that lives in, <laughs> in the Simpsons attic. So that's, that's. I'm disappointed and terrified that you looked up there. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. We have three children, Homer. <laughs> three. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So now, uh. They go down by the pool again, and now Catherine finds a bunch of. This is like every slasher movie where there's the tableau where the killer like. Leaps but then he, them. so he calls the police. Yeah, or or does he? That's the thing. But see, the thing is, it is pretty clear that he is actually talking to someone. Okay. Otherwise, this is a very elaborate ruse. Right, because because they don't show up. And as a matter of fact, he tells her the police aren't coming. He says they're not coming. Yeah, but um, but he's very clearly calling and talking to someone. Yep. Yeah. And then we cut back to the to the cemetery where the girls have taken the body to the cemetery and they start to dig. What they, love this what, they, part. Yeah, what they find is they find a freshly dug grave for a body that's going to go in there eventually. And their whole plan is to dig it a little deeper and throw throw Mrs. Slater's body in there. And then the the coffin for this that's intended for this hole will go in there. Um, and this is, I'll tell you what, though, that's the most ingenious part of their plan. That's actually a pretty good idea. No one will think of it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so so. Queens, I'm telling you, <laughs> both of them. Yep. So Vicky stays in the hole while Liz, I think, is the one who goes back to the car, um, and she gets she's in the front seat. And she gets her her throat cut straight across. Yeah, this is the this is the sight gag with the thing the CB radio oh, yeah, falls keeps, down like, and falling on her, and she keeps trying to put yep. it back up, and it keeps falling. And she gets yeah they they drag the the sharp part of the the cane topper across her throat. No blood, and now it's now it's Vicky's turn finally to get to get killed, and she gets. She gets jammed up a bunch, like stabbed up, stabbed in the back, stabbed in the front, stabbed in the Because then they show it like this lingering shot of her because she's still like in the, the the hole, right? No, she comes out because she she comes out and she goes up to see what Liz was doing. And so like she roll like that's the part where she rolls across the surface of the van, like smears blood on it, like it's Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Because when they show her again, it's like this somewhat savage to this body. Yeah, because she, she gets hit a bunch of times, and then she gets finally stabbed through the eye with it, and then the killer throws the bodies in the uh, in the hole. Catherine and the doctor go there to the cemetery, find the bodies in the hole, of course, um, and then this is when they look in the van and they find Mrs. Slater's body, like in there, and they unwrap it, and she's dead as fuck in there. Like, and this is when he says she's still alive. Uh, yeah. Or maybe he says he's still alive. I don't know. I, it it doesn't be, really he matter. He could be talking about Eric, really. Is, is Nothing about this movie matters, no. really. You're, you know. So in the way back, the doctor sedates Catherine, like, by surprise. He, like, he, he stabs her with, you know, a, a needle full of something. And this is when we begin the, like, trippy Mario Bava scene. Yeah, he says, he says it's a mild sedative. Mild my ass. She but, is, but also mescaline? What she happened? Is tripping balls. This scene is like last year at Marion Bad and um, 
uh, fuck, so, some, I don't know, name something. It's like when Homer eats the chili at the cherry <laughs> Uh, it's that mild. Oh, yeah, and like car- there's like some Carnival of Souls touches in this because like oh yeah no this goes hard into like Carnival of Souls and the Innocence like it has a real sixties edge yeah because so like what the doctor does is he sits her down in a chair and then he goes through the house and essentially like locks all these doors and sets it up like a kill box and he explains to her like we gotta get Eric and you're the bait and so this is the part where she's like looking through and this is this is artfully done it's a very look this is like one of my favorite parts of the whole movie yeah where, this part's really cool like she's looking out and there's like colored lights and it's the whole like bava red and green contrast that they do a lot of and like her dead friends are there and mrs Slater is there and the cane is spinning on its own and like it's, but it also has like a kind of a, a very uh, kind of dark shadows edge to it where it's like it looks a little cheap yeah but it's really effective yeah yeah it's it, yeah, it's a really, really great scene. And it's it's like like and it's also got a touch of like the acid eaters or reefer madness or something like that. Mm-hmm. Right? It's 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 great. Uh, so um, <laughs> once again, here comes Peter who sees uh, <sighs> yep, sees God. sees uh, Catherine in the chair and he goes running at her and the doctor shoots him with a tranquilizer dart. I'll tell you what, if it were not for Peter, they would have had the other dude. Yep. Fucking Peter, man. This fucking guy. They sh- Honestly, they should have killed him just for laughs. Yeah, Peter, nobody wanted you here to begin with. Yep. He has had the worst. Clearly, Catherine didn't. He will, for the rest of his life, he will never go on another blind date. Catherine is, sort of uses this, this moment to, of distraction to sort of get up and run down the hall. There's a really awesome zoomed, like dolly zoom shot as she's running where like the hall seems to move uh, as she's going through it. And she gets into Vicky's room and she finds the gun. The doctor is looking for her and he ends up getting his ass killed by Eric, who like hits him a bunch of times with the cane. And then he hits him like up underneath the chin, which sends him like reeling over the over the railing and he falls to his death. Um, I believe this is when you see Eric's face. Right. So now Catherine has the gun and she goes out to the same railing and she looks over and she sees the doctor's body and she sees Eric standing there just kind of looking at the body. She tries to shoot him with the gun, but like. She obviously doesn't know how it works, like safety mechanism and all that stuff. And this gets Eric's attention. And for just a split second, he looks up and we don't see him. Like we talked about, it. we don't see him very well, but something's off about his appearance. He has like, it's like a, someone put like a clay mask on. Kind of. Yeah. Like it's kind of lumpy looking, but that's about it. Yeah. There's, and honestly, I, this is, like I said, like, I think I really wish that they had like mined a little bit more out of the sort of medical experimentation that like, you could have really gotten some mileage out of that. Um, and maybe sacrificing a little bit of the whodunit angle for it. They, we're, we're really rounding the corner towards the end. Catherine hides in the bathroom and she finds uh, poor Jeannie's head in the toilet, which is my favorite shot of the entire movie because it's not like a dummy head. It's like they they made yeah. they put the toilet like around her actual body and so her head is is in there it's like her real head you know in the toilet poor girl and then her eyes open and, uh her eyes open in one of Catherine's hallucinations cuz we get a little bit more of that cuz now Catherine runs up and hides in the attic she's got the gun and she uses the jack in the box to to lure Eric up uh, but it turns out that he's already there. Oh, Catherine, he's already up yeah. there, and she's she's struggling to to remain conscious at this point because the drugs are really are really in her. She's still tripping balls, and this is when we see the head in the toilet again, and that's when Jeannie opens her eyes, and then it turns out. I think this part is actually pretty cool. It works. It's great. now you know it's coming. Like you you know it's coming. Oh, they set it up earlier because the bot like the 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 Harlequin costume is set up when she finds it almost as though somebody's wearing it, but she touches it and nobody is but now eric has already been up there he's been up there the whole time that she's been trying to lure him um and they struggle and he knocks the gun uh out of her hand and she kind of goes reeling and she finds a baby doll and rips the head off of it and finds the deadliest spike that apparently was holding this baby doll's head on like this is a dangerous i believe that is how they used to be made god damn that is some dangerous shit because it is like it's like an ice pick yeah she stabs him and she stabs the shit out of him stabs him a whole bunch of times he goes reeling and he falls down the steps um and we see the you know eyes in the mask closed like presumably she has killed him but it's a slasher movie so you know and now she's overcome by the drugs and she passes out at the top of the steps 
and we cut back to Eric's face in the mask and his eyes open. Fade to black credits roll. Do you know about the alternate ending? I've heard I've heard about one where she's in some sort of institution and he's pushing her in a wheelchair or something. So the way this was supposed to end was, uh, you know, she she stabs shit out of him. He falls down, uh, eyes open, and then they cut away and they cut back. And it's the Harlequin costume floating in the pool. And the paramedics show up and the paramedics are like taking all the bodies out of the house and they they drag the Harlequin body out of the pool. And it turns out that it's Catherine in the costume in the pool and she's dead. Huh. And he said that he wanted he didn't want he didn't like that that horror movies had like always ended with the girl, the final person living. It's like he wanted this to just everyone fucking salt the earth. But the distributor insisted that it end with a final. Movie. OK. Yeah, I, I gotta t- I gotta say I gotta go with them. I like there are occasionally movies where, uh, like horror movies that end on that down note where like the bad guy wins or something like that. I fucking love that. Like I think the Babadook ends that way where they you know they survive, but at what cost? They're now kind of like subservient to the spirit. Um, the that reason that uh, Mike Flanagan Haunting of Hill House e- ends with the house winning. Uh, like I love when that happens. Not all the time. Well, that's obviously. how the original. That's how house. Uh, that's how the haunting of Hill House ends. Yeah, yeah. But like, like that's how the book ends. Like, it's like they just fucking leave. Oh, but I didn't. Ex- they, I don't. I didn't expect anybody to actually like. I didn't expect that. Basically, like even though that's how Shirley Jackson intended it, they just they don't fucking do that in movies. And TV. That's also how Black Christmas ends. Black. I love that. Like, I love that about Black Christmas. Like, like yeah, the cops show up, but the dude's still there. Yeah. Yep. I love that ending. So. Overall, I think the movie itself is a bit of a mess, but yeah, it's several ideas stitched together and none of them are very clear, um, but it works. It works. It, it They clearly pulled the wool over my eyes with the the whole whodunit thing. Like, I honestly like there were times where I was like, it's fucking Peter, the killer or something, because he, he comes and he goes and he shows up in like time. How could he be the killer? The He's thing. incompetent at a he can't even go on a date. Oh, it could have been a whole like, I don't know. It could have been a blind thing. But like they, they they're there. That was early on. And maybe it's just because the inclusion of Peter as a character is just ineffable. I will never understand it. And so I'm just trying to connect the fucking dots with this guy. It's a it's a good it's a great movie. I I, yeah. I recommend it. I think it's I think it's fantastic. Um, and it's, it also at a time when slasher movies, like this was 82. So we were really starting to hit, a uh, a terminal point where like everything that had really been done with the body count movie had really been done. And so, yeah, even, they're about to get into some real cheap crap. Yeah. Like, but at, at, even at this point, like this movie twists the formula in, in just, just enough for it to be very good, very effective. Overall, it's great. Yep. It's a good pick. I'm glad you brought it to my attention. So uh, what are we doing next week? Ah, uh, Well, uh, June is Pride Month. Oh, yes, it, it is. And it's particularly important this year. Yeah. So uh, we are going to watch some uh, kind of queer movies. Yep. Weird. The first one is Vamp. Aha. Uh-huh. All right. I'm into it. I'm into it. Yep. The woke mind virus has gotten its its evil, wicked tendrils in us. We have been, uh, yep. we've been embraced by the woke mob. So... Uh, yeah, we'll see you in two weeks when we go woke and do vamp. <laughs>